Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about Honduras. Our guest, Alison Lira, is the director of the Honduras Program for the Witness for Peace Solidarity Collective. You can see solidaritycollective.org. Alison Lira holds a BA in philosophy from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and an MPhil in conflict resolution and reconciliation from Trinity College, Dublin. Alison, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thanks for coming on and for the work you're doing. What is happening uh, lately in Honduras and what role is the U.S. government playing? Yeah, there's there's a lot happening in Honduras. It's been a, a really uh, interesting and exciting year to be uh, living here. So I have been part of the, the Honduras program, the Women's Peace Solidarity Collective, uh, since January of 2020, so I'm coming up on two years and uh, 2021. And so I've been here during the transition from uh, the Juan Orlando Hernandez administration in Honduras to the election of the first female president in Honduras, President Xiomara Castro. And that's been a, a really big transition because uh, for a lot of Hondurans, this has been kind of marking the end of what is called the post-coup period, the narco dictatorship that um, stretches back to the 2009 uh, military-backed coup. And so in Honduras 2009, uh, there was a coup that deposed um, the president at that time, Manuel Zelaya, um, and that gave life to a, a period in which um, there were serious repression of, of, of the hundred people. There was um, wide-scale kind of human rights violations. And in the end, uh, Juan Orlando Hernandez, who just recently came out of power, has now been extradited to the United States to face major drug trafficking charges. Um, and uh, President Xiomara Castro is actually the wife of Manuel Zelaya, who had been deposed in 2009. And so it's we're very much seeing kind of like a full circle kind of deal. And this government has come in with promises of um, kind of righting the wrongs of the last eight years of, um, of the post-coup period. Is, is the U.S. government also trying to right any wrongs or do any better? This was a coup that the U.S. government supported, correct? Yes, the, the U.S. government uh, supported the 2009 coup. They certainly certified it. And so, you know, at the time, uh, there were calls for Manuel Zelaya to be reinstated. And instead, the, the post-coup kind of regime called an election that was largely considered to be illegitimate. The United States came out and, and backed that, that election. They did it again in 2017. In 2017, Juan Orlando Hernandez ran for a second term, despite the fact that um, the Honduran Constitution says that you're not, presidents aren't able to run for more than a term. And then there was a uh, wide scale uh, indications of a fraud, the OIS, the Organization of American States called for a revote, and the United States went against the international community entirely, and once again kind of certified the election, despite the fact that there was like mass mobilizations on the on the on the ground. There was huge repression by Honduran security forces that are funded by the United States, um, continue to be funded by the United States. Um, and today, the United States uh, you, continues to play a role that very clearly has not learned the lessons of the past. You know, they backed the one under government for the eight years that it was in power. Um, they funded his military forces that were used to not only repress folks, but also to facilitate narco trafficking through the country. Um, and, uh, and what we're seeing in the new government is that a lot of, uh, like, that U.S. intervention has shifted, but not necessarily uh, to benefit the, the Honduran people. We can get into the specifics of that. Like, yeah, but, the, but the U.S. bases and U.S. troops have not gone anywhere. They're still in Honduras, right? Yeah. So, like, Honduras has historically been, uh, uh, like, a launch point uh, for the U.S. intervention across the region. So we know that 
you know, during the, the Contra War in Nicaragua, Honduras was used as like a, a point of, of organization for, for their intervention there. And so, yes, Honduras, I mean, the United States maintains the, the, the military interest that they have in Honduras, and they have a really serious interest in, in maintaining it with this government. And this government has largely maintained uh, cooperation, security cooperation with the United States um, for reasons that are their own, but there are definitely some indications as to, as to why, you know, the, the, the incoming administration in, in, in Honduras came in with astronomical levels of, of debt. Uh, I think about 70% of the Honduran GDP is, is tied up in, in servicing debts. Um, and so there's just, there's not a lot of leveraging power when it comes to countering uh, U.S. interests. You know, the other thing that we're seeing right now that's, you know, deeply concerning is that uh, Central America is starting to get caught up in uh, the U.S.'s uh, uh, dispute with China. And we're starting to see that uh, the U.S. has a serious interest in countering Chinese influence in, in Honduras and in Central America. And that's also producing a lot of, you know, kind of knock-on effects that are, that are not great. Um, for the Honduran economy and social well-being. And, and one point, Alison Lira, of some slight disagreement between Honduras and the United States is around something called zones for employment and economic development, right? Well, what are those? Yeah, so, so, so the studies are... Um, are a, a super kind of like extreme neoliberal free trade regime that uh, appeared shortly after the coup. It, basically, it's it's a it's a free trade kind of structure in which foreign investors are authorized to uh, you know take pieces of, of Honduran land and and do what they want with it. So it, it authorizes Honduran investors to set up their own laws within those specific zones, to set up their own um, judicial infrastructure, to set up their own administration of health, education, to decide who gets to live there, who doesn't get to live there. It's been largely criticized as, as authorizing foreign investors to create a state within a state. And when the initiative, when the law first got passed in Honduras, it was pretty immediately declared unconstitutional by the, by the Supreme Court at that time. Um, and in 20... Uh, 14, the, the government, of the post-government of Honduras basically illegally fires uh, the four judges that had voted against the, the, the law and replaces them with loyalists, repasses the law, uh, which then subsequently goes up to the Supreme Court, and that Supreme Court kind of rules that, that it's constitutional, despite the fact that um, the, the second law that got passed, which is the 2013 Senate law, um, was very similar to, to the previous law that had been declared unconstitutional. And then from there, uh, there's there's not a lot of talk about the CEDES until the Juan Orlando government announces the launch of three of them in the spring of 2020, which was like at the height of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it kind of took everyone by surprise because the development of the CEDES had, had not been a, a transparent or participatory um, process. And um, and the first kind of community to ring the alarm bell on the Cedes is the community of Crawfish Rock, which is a community on the island of Roatan, who uh, learned that the government, without consultation, had given a piece of their municipality to a sede uh, owned by a U.S. company called um, Prospera. Um, and Prospera, you know, is 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 a is a sede that is um, kind of opaque in its functions. They're they're building kind of residential infrastructure. There's some talk about being a, a safe haven for, for Bitcoin investors, and, and there's a lot of concern because uh, the they technically have um, or that now there are the crawfish rock community piece of their community is now under the jurisdiction of the sede, which means that their land can be expropriated, that they are now subject to sede laws. Um, and because the law gives um, foreign investors wide kind of powers, uh, they, they, you know, could be found, they could, they are at risk of being kind of dispossessed and displaced from their own 
own territory. And this kind of like triggered a mass mobilization in Honduras. And so last year there was uh, protests across the country, 70 municipalities um, declared that, uh, that, uh, that they were free of said that they did not want said every single like leading civil society and grassroots organization declared themselves against said including the, the biggest business lobbies in Honduras. And then when Xiomara Castro comes into power, uh, she, uh, comes into power on an anti said platform, which then subsequently turns into a, a vote in Congress, which is a unanimous vote, a unanimous, a unanimous vote to overturn the Senate law. And that should have been kind of like it, but because Honduras is, is subject to a lot of US intervention, um, there is uh, some heavy international pressure uh, from um, foreign investors. And now it seems the US government to kind of force the Honduran people to, uh, uh, allow for status to continue operating despite the fact that it is a super unpopular policy that came out of a, a period in which democratic norms were not being observed. Uh, observed. And so two of the, the mechanisms for pressure has been CAFTA, uh, which is um, the Central American Free Trade Agreement, which uh, is, imposes on its signers, including Honduras, some really uh, kind of horrible stipulations around investor guarantees. So Prospera has announced that they're, they, they are suing um, the Honduran government for, I think, $10 billion um, for overturning the Sede law and therefore kind of like violating the guarantee, the investor guarantee that Honduras is responsible for giving its investors. And on October 13th, uh, two senators in the Senate Relations Committee, Senators Haggerty and Cardin, published a letter which basically criticized the Honduran government for overturning the CEDES laws and backing the narrative that in doing so they have violated investor stability agreements and therefore put in jeopardy kind of the investor environment in Honduras. But how, Allison, is, I mean, this didn't just come out of a period of weak democracy and a coup government. It is the antithesis of democracy. I mean, it sounds like 19th century filibusters going and creating their own countries in Nicaragua as, as private individuals. I mean, to have private companies have a piece of territory in a country and be able to make their own laws there, it... it it sounds in absolutely outrageous, like the entire world ought to be scandalized by the very idea, but in particular, the US government, when it's dumping endless weapons and war making into supposedly spreading democracy around the world. How, do, how does this fit at all with a crusade of spreading democracy? Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's been really outrageous. And, and honestly, I was very surprised to see the letter come out of, of um, the letter from these senators, because yes, I mean, CEDES are not just kind of like how they were uh, developed in Honduras, but genuinely how they are made to operate in Honduras are incredibly anti-democratic. Uh, and a lot of people, and, and Colonial, neo-colonial. A lot of people have have compared the CEDES to a return to the banana plantations, where uh, U.S. Uh, fruit companies were able to um, basically operate uh, autonomously within areas of influence in in Central America, and that's exactly what the CEDES are trying to force down the throats of the Honduran people. Um, it. it, it the, the CEDES, the way that the law is, is built is that the CEDES are completely unaccountable um, to any democratic process in Honduras. Um, foreign investors are authorized to create laws that do not have to abide by the Honduran Constitution. There are six articles in the Honduran Constitution for which they are explicitly made to, to abide by, and the rest is up to them. They, they, uh, basic rights not guaranteed include habeas corpus, the right to freedom of expression, the right to, to, to movement, the right to counsel, like all of these major basic things um, 
labor uh, agreements, protections that Hondurans have, have fought and died for, also not uh, applicable to CEDES. Um, and uh, what's kind of insane is that CEDES proponents, like, for example, the Washington, D.C.-based think tank Center for Strategic International Studies, who have come out with a, a report kind of talking about the greatest, uh, the, the greatest economic, well, basically the report is claims that CEDES are a vehicle for improving rule of law in Honduras. What's ironic about their report is that it's directly funded and they state that it's directly funded by CEDES Prospera. And the report is, the reason why I mention it is because they're directly quoted in the Carden Haggerty Law. And the claim is that because Foreign investors are given carte blanche to create whatever legal regime they want within their zones that uh, that this allows them to experiment with the very best of what exists around good governance, um, which is a, a, a delusional way of thinking about what, 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 what is actually likely in terms of what kinds of legal systems a sede is interested in setting up, right? When you have an area in which foreign investors have full control over setting up a, a legal system in which they are not uh, uh, off, like they are not obligated to uh, abide by any laws democratically created by the Honduran state, and they are also not uh, obligated to give Hondurans meaningful participation in the creation of these uh, legal systems, what's going to happen is that in zones, instead of areas that are owned and operated by foreign investors, they're going to create laws that benefit their bottom line. They're going to create laws that don't protect the environment, that give workers minimum protections and, 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 and salaries, and that make it so that as much money goes into their pockets. It's logical. Um, that, uh, that the legal systems would be created for the interests of the company um, that operates those zones. And to say that these areas um, have anything to do with improving rule of law and protections for the Honduran people is ludicrous, just given the basic structure of how these are meant to work. And what kind of companies are we talking about? Some of them are probably mining companies and environmental destruction is not a, not a really minor concern in terms of what they're doing, right? Yeah, so the three sedes that are currently in operation is Sede Prospera, which is on the island of Roatan, which like I said, has a, a really kind of vague purpose. Um, they're building residential area, I mean like, uh, buildings. They're going to be homes to Bitcoin investment. And honestly, like it's been those who have analyzed it have criticized it as, as basically potentially being at risk of being a safe haven for, for money laundering um, because they're kind of an area that is experimenting with kind of like the most unregulated of, of financial transactions in the world. Then there's um, uh, another set called Sede Orquidia, which is meant to be, which we don't know a lot about, and is meant to be uh, an area for agricultural production, which of course the concern there is, is that um, it will be an area in which workers are giving very little labor protections and they won't have access to the Honduran system because they'll be subject to a Sede Honduran system that was created for and by the company. Um, and then there's another Sede and my, the name of it is, I'm forgetting, but it's owned by an Italian man in Choluteca who's meant, uh, and that area is meant to be a, um, a zone for manufacturing. It's meant to be a, a maquiladora zone, which of course, again, comes up, up, up upon the same concerns around labor protections. Um, and, but yes, I mean, the, the law again is, is it's astounding um, how much of, the, the Honduran nation could potentially be given away to foreign investors. There are no um, land restrictions. There also aren't restrictions for use, meaning that a sede can be created for anything, including mining. Um, and, you know, the, the particularly egregious kind of stipulation of the sede law is that for in, uh, in areas deemed low population zones, 
um, the Honduran state can impose a sede without consultation for the communities that are living there. And the UN did a, a study that found that 35% of like Honduran land mass is considered low population zones. So in 35, if you live in that 35% of, of the country, a sede could have been imposed on you without consultation. Um, and so uh, the, the Honduran government is, is completely right when it says that the sede uh, law violates uh, basic sovereignty, that they have had a right to overturn it. Um, and it is completely inappropriate that two U.S. senators who are from the United States of America, who claims to care about values of democracy um, and freedom and sovereignty and all of these things, would go and criticize the, the, the Castro government um, for overturning this law. For for years and years, as you know, Allison, uh, reasonable people have suggested that the U.S. approach of blaming and demonizing immigrants and abusing immigrants uh, would be better replaced by an approach of ceasing to make people's homes south of the U.S. border such miserable places to live in that they have to flee them. And now Vice President Kamala Harris claims to be doing just that, uh, to be improving lives in Central America, uh, not because we should care about people's lives, but so they stop coming here because we don't like them. But what, uh, what truth is there to that claim uh, that the U.S. is now seeing about humanitarian aid and improving people's lives in Honduras? Yeah, so, you know, the most visible kind of like public policy around Central America is Biden's uh, plan to address what they call the root causes of migration in Central America. So we've been seeing, you know, massive waves of, of migrants coming out of Central America in large part due to the narco dictatorship that they funded and, and uh, for, for eight years. Um, and there is this plan where the Biden administration has committed $4 billion over four years to invest in Central America. Kamala Harris has also started a, the Partnership for Central America, which is basically she's gotten $3.2 billion in private sector commitments for investments to, to the region. And they're touting this as this kind of like massive U.S. effort to kind of like solve the root cause of migration by investing in strengthening rule of law and economic development. You know, I think one of the things that uh, I talk a lot about here in Honduras with, with Honduran organizations, right, is that like while uh, 4 billion and 3.2 billion might seem like big figures, um, they're not because when you look at the remittances that migrants send to their families every year in Central America, they far outpace these these investments from the U.S. government. So, like in 2020, uh, 30 billion in remittances went to Central America. To Honduras alone, it was 5.7 billion in one year. Meaning that, like when we when we're talking about economic investments and giving uh, people the resources that they need to stay at home. Migrants in the United States working are doing way more <laughs> to keep uh, Central Americans in Central America than the U.S. government uh, is ever going to be willing to do. And then when you actually look at the breakdown of what the $4 billion in the Biden plan is going to be used for, you see that it has nothing to do with improving the lives of, of the Central American people. It has everything to do with pushing the same destructive U.S. interests that they have always pushed. So a large chunk, almost half of that $4 billion is going to fund the CARSI initiative, the Central American Regional Security Initiative, which is an initiative to fight narco trafficking. Essentially, almost half of that money is going to security forces in the region, the Honduran security forces that have been certified. It is documented that they're involved in wide scale corruption, um, and that they participate in the very narco trafficking that the Carsey Initiative is meant to be countering. Um, it's money given to, to, to uh, security forces that, uh, that catalyzed the coup in 2009, that uh, extrajudicially killed its people in 2017, um, and, and that have played no function in the security of the Honduran people. The other half of the money is being used um, to advance 
the U.S. interest in creating markets for their companies and in countering and, in, and is part of the, the Chinese kind of uh, dispute. So um, the, the Biden administration has demonstrated an interest in expanding the manufacturing center, sector in, in Honduras because they want to relocate um, the manufacturing that is happening in China to an area where they feel like they have more control, which in this case is, is Honduras. So what has this meant? This has meant that uh, the U.S. Embassy uh, came down really hard on the, on the Honduran government when they overturned the pay-by-hour law. It was a law that was passed in the Juan Hernando years that was highly criticized for basically authorizing uh, private companies in Honduras to, uh, to, um, to pay, to not have to give workers uh, certain pay protections. It was basically a law that authorized insecure uh, uh, labor protections or uh, labor labor conditions. Um, the Dogu, uh, the ambassador Dogu, came down really hard, publicly criticized the Honduran state for overturning this law that basically authorized companies to exploit their workers, saying that it was going to uh, impact uh, investment in the region. And the Kamala Harris Initiative has, um, for private sector investment, has. Uh, uh, banked on and has, is now supporting uh, companies, for example, Sanmar, which is a U.S. company that has a subsidiary in, in Honduras that has been denounced uh, in front of the Inter-American Commission for uh, labor rights violations because a bunch of workers are coming out with serious injuries and are not being properly compensated. So those are the kind of companies that the Kamala Harris Initiative is, is, is backing. Um, again, like not to... Uh, produce better working conditions to create good, sustainable jobs for Honduras, but actually to create uh, insecure manufacturing jobs that will create products for the U.S. government, uh, for the U.S. people at the, the cheapest price as possible. Like, that is their interest here. Um, uh, so, yeah. yeah. We have about one minute left, Allison. Uh, it seems we're seeing this positive trend in elections in Latin America, but the debt is still there. The troops are still there. The so-called aid is still there. The corporate trade agreements are already in place. Uh, are, are the trends uh, positive or negative? Uh, what needs to be done and where can people keep in touch and follow up with what you're working on? Yeah, I mean, in Latin America, there's a lot of really important things happening right now. You know, the, the election in Colombia has been historic. I think it, it has the potential to set the tone for, for, for Latin America in really important ways. Um, there's been a lot of other countries that have moved left. Mexico also, uh, in Central America specifically, things look um, not great. You know, I, Guatemala is, is going through some serious issues, as is El Salvador. Um, and in Honduras, you know, yeah, I, I think that there's, it's been um, many years of, of, um, of crisis, and it's, it's going to take a while to see, to see changes. Um, so, yeah. I Unfortunately, mean, I we'll have to follow up with another show. I'm sorry that I wish we could go on for hours, but we're over time. We've been speaking with Allison Lira, who is director of the Honduras Program for the Witness for Peace Solidarity Collective. The website is solidaritycollective.org. Allison, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.